Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 121 of the Box Art Podcast, episode 1 to 1. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as always by Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. We're going to just recap on a few fights this week on this show here. Um, there isn't too much to preview, so that little part shouldn't take too long. But let's get down to the reviewing. Obviously, there was quite a few fights on last week. Um, I'm going to start over in the Ponds Falls Arena in Sheffield, Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Um, I think there's one or two fights to mention on this bill. Um I just want to give a quick shout out to William Warburton, obviously, um, you know, a well-known um, journeyman. He actually got a draw with a guy who was 7-0, and who was undefeated, obviously, so credit to him. And also, Adam Jones was on the bill. People know um, that listen to this show, Adam Jones, I've said many, many times, he's a hard, hard mofo. Well, he actually got an upset win also. He's a journeyman. He got his seventh professional win. Uh, he actually beat a guy who was 8-1 and one with two draws, so two... Um, partial upsets I suppose there obviously a loss for one of the home fighters and also a draw so two upsets there for the journeyman in favour of those um, and the main event here Josh Wilde defending his British bantamweight title he defended successfully against Bobby Jenkinson it was a ninth round TKO in favour of Josh Wilde uh, I think Jenkinson was also down in the 7th if I'm not mistaken uh, so yeah, credit to Josh Wilde to get the win there. He's now 26 and nine with two draws. Moving over now to Russia, this one was the uh, you know the big one really, the WBSS, the World Boxing Super Series Cruiserweight Semi Final. We were going to find out here who would be taking on Usyk in Saudi Arabia. But let's talk about uh, the undercard. A couple of fights to mention: Fedor Chudinov. He was supposed to be taking on another guy. I forgot his name now. He was supposed to be taking on um what's his name Bobby Gunn Jr but that fight for whatever reason fell through and he got a late replacement in the shape of Timo Lane who's 21 and 9 Chudinov managed to win a seventh round stoppage the uh, the corner of Timo Lane pulled him out after seven rounds so he retired on his storm Fedor Chudinov successfully defended his WBA international super middleweight title he's now 17 and 2 Fedor Chudinov I think he's quite underrated, to be honest. He's, he's he's had some real bad luck in his career, if you know about that. Um, moving up to the main event now, really, I, as I'm sure you watched this one. Who hasn't? It was a fantastic, fantastic fight. Murat Gassiev, 25-0, took on Yunia Dortikos, 22-0. Obviously, Dortikos, the really heavy-handed Cuban. I actually predicted on here that Dortikos would win by knockout. You went with Dortikos on points, but the listeners got it right once again, as they seem to do time and time again Gassiev won by knockout in the 12th round Dortikos was down three times in that 12th round firstly I asked before I break it down what did you make of it a really good fight once again this tournament seriously delivers every time oh yes what a really good fight was what can I say wow Gassiev put on a very very good performance and he knocked last 15 seconds and knocked him out but now well done to Gassiev for winning that fight now he fights Usyk in the final and now there's going to be a very good final because, first of all, it's going to happen in Saudi Arabia. And second of all, the right person is going to get win big money. But my, like I said, my, my, I told from everyone from the start in the podcast that I think that personally Usyk's going to win this. But good luck to Gassia for his training because um, he ain't got long left till he fights Usyk in the final. On that performance there, to be honest, I mean, I'd still favour Usyk, but I don't see a stoppage. I think it could be quite a close fight. Just, um, you know, Looking at Breedis and the way you know he had some early success against Usyk, I think Gassiev, you know, if he starts early against Usyk, it could be a really, really interesting fight. Um, but yeah, the fight itself, I mean, I think Dortikos started quite 
quite good. I think he started out quite good in you know in the first part of the fight. I'd say probably uh, nicked the first round for sure. The second round I gave to Gassiev. The third round I gave to Dortikos. The fourth round I gave to Dortikos, and then the fifth and sixth round I both uh, I gave both of those to Gassiev. So after six rounds, I actually had it three three in terms of the rounds. Um, I thought the seventh and eighth rounds were really really close. Again, these rounds could have gone either way. Um, I was really impressed with Dortikos. You know, I think he's you know he's definitely much more than just a power puncher but he certainly has that the ninth round I kind of for me anyway I kind of saw Gassiev really have a big round there he seemed to use his left hand excellently particularly in that ninth round left uppercuts under the guard left hooks to the head left hooks to the body it was a really really big round for Gassiev and at that point it was the clearest round of the fight because all the other rounds were um, you know, quite close, like I say. But yeah, in that tenth round, it was pretty much the same. Gassiev started to put a bit of a beating on Dortikos by that stage. A variety of you know different shots breaking up Dortikos' defense. Uh, it was a big round for Gassiev once again. But credit to Dortikos again for just taking those shots and still walking forward. He wasn't to take a step back really for till this part of the fight at least. Um, the 11th round, again, was an even bigger round for Gassiev. It seemed like, by this stage, Dortikos was running out of steam. Dortikos almost got dropped in that 11th as well. And um, Gassiev does that, that that Golovkin move, where he kind of throws like a left jab, followed by a left uppercut straight after it. The problem with that is the first shot's coming from your chest. So if you imagine, if you're throwing it right from your chest... All the power's on that shot, and then he doesn't bring his hand back before he throws another shot with the same hand, so that second shot's a bit of an arm punch. But, you know, in the case of Golovkin and Gassiev, they've got enough power in just an arm punch to really, really hurt you, you know? So, um, exciting style Gassiev's got. Really impressed me. Dortikos, once again, credit to him. Um, you know, he'd only gone 10 rounds twice previously, and those two fights, I'm sure, were not at this kind of pace. Um, you know, although the fight won't happen now, could you imagine Breedis' style matched up against Gassiev? I think that would be a serious war, as I said, um, I think once or twice before on this podcast. But yeah, credit to Abel Sanchez also in the corner of Gassiev. I thought that his corner work was excellent. He kept bellowing instructions in the corner at Gassiev. It almost seemed a little bit too urgent because by the stage where he was really shouting at Gassiev, I felt that Gassiev was bossing the fight, but I like the motivational factor in what Abel Sanchez was saying saying although the translator was probably translating what Abel said in Russian um, probably not carrying the you know the intensity of the way Abel was actually saying it but it was what it was the 12th round I mean boy oh boy um, I'd say Dortikos was probably winning the round until he got caught with that massive left hook counter that put him down a really really big knockdown you know the first one he did really well to to get back up to be honest um he got knocked down again just six seconds after getting up. It was a bit of a untidy knockdown. Hard to really see which shot had actually hurt him. He then got up once again, and then, of course, he got knocked through the ropes. Um, once again, it was a bit of an untidy knockdown. I couldn't really see anything land, to be honest. It seemed more like a... Uh, a momentum kind of knockdown. Uh, there, there was there was about 15 seconds left in the round, like you said, I So I think um, Dortikos was was quite unlucky to not really make it through that round. But after being knocked down three times, you can't really blame the referee. Um, but if it did go to points, Dortikos would have lost quite a big points. Um, you know, quite a big points decision. But seeing. Um, Yusik and Gassiev face off in the ring afterwards. Even that made me get goosebumps. I mean, it's going to be a fantastic fight come May 11th. You said yourself, I as you think that Yusik wins this. I would probably say Yusik on points. Do you share that opinion, or do you reckon Yusik can get the stoppage? I think Yusik will win on points. Yeah, I think I think that's the same as me, and I'm sure. I think after the fight, they asked um, Duke McKenzie and... Um, Richie Woodall, I think they both agreed that Usyk will probably win that fight on points, so I think it's a bit of a popular um, opinion there, and yeah, just just for the record, my scorecard was 107-104 at the time of the stoppage in favour of Gassiev, but like I say, if Dortikos did end up surviving that 12th round with, with the 15 seconds to go, it would have been a 10-6 round anyway, because he was down three times. But yeah, really, really, really good fight. Credit to both guys once again. Um, Gassiev now the new IBF and WBA Super World Cruiserweight Champion. He's now 26-0, and Dortikos is now 22-1. and No shame in losing... 
to a man like Gassiev. Some beautiful scenes afterwards as well. Did you see the little clip I has where um where Gassiev at the at the post fight press conference he saw that Dortikos was quite emotional. I think he was a bit tearful, and Gassiev left his seat to go over there and give him a little bit of a hug sort of thing. And also when he had to hand um, you know the belt back after the fight, he went into the into the dressing room of Dortikos and you know he gave it back to him personally and you know took pictures with him and all the rest of it. He seems like a really nice guy, Gassiev. It was good to see that after the battle that they both had for thirty six minutes almost. Um, um, what did you make of that, Ayaz? Did you manage to see any of those little clips there? Really nice. No, unfortunately, I didn't get to see any of the clips. All right. Well, you know, check those out because they're quite nice. Moving over now to the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. I was at this card. A um, couple fights to mention on the undercard before we move on to the bigger things. Gamal Yafai. I seem to miss this fight. I got there when the doors opened, so I don't know if this one was before anybody was sitting down because I, I didn't see it at all. I actually was expecting to see the fight at some point, and everybody was saying, no, the fight's already happened, that they've checked on Twitter and seen that he won the fight. So um, Gamal Yafai picked up a KO in round three against Jose Hernandez, who was 4-16. and 16. Gamal Yafai find now 14 and 0 again he fights um, exactly a month after that date against Gavin McDonald that one should be a good fight um, Nick Webb was on the card as well Nick Webb I mean, he took on a guy who wasn't any great shakes. The guy was only 3-4 and four with one draw. Nick Webb 11-0 and 0 going in. The one thing about Nick Webb, he can certainly punch. And we saw that in that second round. I mean, it was a huge, huge knockout punch. When I got home, I had to... Um, I had to, you know, watch it again. It was such a big shot. I mean, he completely, completely decapitated the guy. Um, you know, huge overhand right. It was just an absolute peach of a shot. And that is the one thing that he does have that you can say, you know, you can't really knock that. Some people saying he's not a great fighter. He certainly has got a big punch and he's certainly got a fight ending punch. So credit to... Uh, Nick Webb, I think he's quite a nice guy as well. I uh, sent him a, a congratulation message after the fight and he replied to me at about 6 in the morning, so I'm sure he enjoyed the night properly. Um, also on this bill, Sean McGoldrick moved to 4-0. and It was a TKO after three rounds against Michael Barner. Uh, Danny Dignam moved to 5-0. and It was a points win over six rounds against Daryl Sharp. Josh Buatzi moved to 4-0, and a TKO in round two against Jordan Joe. If it was a bit of a step up there for Boatsy, and once again he gets the stoppage. If I'm not mistaken, I think Jordan Joseph had never been stopped despite only losing the one fight. I think he lost on points. So, um, credit to Josh Boatsy. Also on the bill, Charlie Edwards. I managed to see this fight. Um, this one was, I think, the first fight after I got there. He moved to 12-1. and one. He took on a guy called Ricky Little. It was a TKO in the very first round for Charlie Edwards. I think it was um, I think it was two, two knockdowns, if I'm not mistaken. Both body shots, if I can remember correctly. Um, also on the bill, Paul Butler. He moved to 26-1. and one, A TKO in the eighth and final round against a guy called Jefferson Vargas, who was only 5-7. and seven. So... I remember watching that fight and it was it was a bit of a boring fight. I mean, to take a guy who's 5 and 7 and we're talking about Paul Butler here, former world champion who really is kind of I don't know, like his stock seems to have gone properly down. I know he's just got with Eddie Hearn, but yeah, I mean to go 8 rounds with a guy who's 5 and 7 and you're a former world champion, it wasn't a good look. Um also on this bill, Felix Cash, he moved to 8-0. and oh, It was a TKO in round 5 for him. He took on a guy called James Hagen Imana, who was 8-6 and six with one draw again. These fights so far weren't really great fights. They were, you know, heavily stacked in the home fighters' favour here in terms of what was actually going to happen, the fight outcome. It was a few mismatches on this bill, to be honest. But coming down to the three big fights, and the three big fights were fights that I really thought were quite close to 50-50s going in. I'm going to start with Reese Bellotti, 11 and 0. He took on Ben Jones, 22 and 6 with one draw. It was a TKO in round six for Reese Bellotti. Ben Jones came in overweight. He wasn't eligible to win the Commonwealth title, which of course belonged and still belongs to Reese Bellotti. Um, 
you know, I really felt sorry for Ben Jones because he's a really nice guy. Everybody knows that that listens to this show. He really is an honest, honest guy. And to be honest, I think where he had quite a close fight with Jason Cunningham, I think those two guys are probably around the same sort of level. The only thing here is that when um, Ben Jones took on Reese Bellotti, he couldn't really get into his groove or really win a round, to be honest. I mean, he's quite tough, and he showed that, and you know, he's quite stubborn when he's in the ring, Ben Jones, which makes this a really good win for Reese Bellotti, because it was another step up. But, um, yeah, I think... Cunningham and, and Ben Jones are around about the same level and it just so happens that Reese Bellotti's knocked them both out in the exact same round, that sixth round there. So yeah, quite a one-sided win there for Reese Bellotti and obviously, you know, he's he's gonna be a quite a good fighter. I think we all agree on that. He's now twelve and oh with eleven knockouts, if I'm not mistaken. And once again, commiserations to Ben Jones, now twenty two and seven with one draw, a much better fighter than his record suggests. Moving up the bill once again now to Ted Cheeseman, 12 and 0. He took on Carson Jones, 40 and 12, with three draws. Carson Jones, obviously carrying 30 wins by knockout as well. Um, it was for the vacant WBA International Super Welterweight title, but unfortunately, Jones, Carson Jones, obviously came in overweight, so he wasn't eligible to win the title. So it's a bit of a shame. It kind of took the shine off the bill a little bit. The three big fights, two of the opponents didn't actually make the weight, so that was a big shame. Um, you know, Jones, I mean, he did well in the first few rounds. Uh, you know, he had he had quite a good start despite being 31. He's, he's an old 31, to be honest. Um, obviously, by far, it was Cheeseman's best fight. There was a few storms that Cheeseman had to weather early. And one thing I will say about Cheeseman, he finds angles very, very well. And sometimes you don't know he's found the angle till he, till he lands the shot from that angle. It's, it's always, it seems to be too late. But yeah, he's very, very good at finding angles. Um, you know, he shot varieties brilliant cheeseman picked some great great shots against carson jones and jones looked a little bit one-dimensional i mean once he was tired he was just throwing clubbing shots that were mainly being blocked to be honest he got through with the odd shot here and there and like i say cheeseman did really well to get through uh you know through those little question marks there but as expected cheeseman's conditioning was you know in another league to jones's and as the rounds went on um you know, he's, he just kind of ran away with it a little bit, especially in the second half of the fight. Cheeseman really, really performed, you know, impressively. Um, there was a big shot. I can't remember which round it was, but there was a big shot by Jones that seemed to rock Cheeseman at some point in that fight. I can't really remember when it was. I think it was quite late. But, um, yeah, that's another fight that we predicted on IAS. I think, if I'm not mistaken, did you go with Cheeseman to win? Yeah, you did. You went with Cheeseman to win on points. So did the listeners. I was trying to be a little bit daring, a little bit audacious, and I was made to pay. I went with Carson Jones by knockout, so I, as in the listeners, gain a point once again, which I hate to say. The new WBA International Super Welterweight Champion now, Ted Cheeseman, 13-0. and And the main event, Lawrence Acoli, 7-0, and took on Isaac Chamberlain, 9-0. and it was for the vacant WBA Continental Cruiserweight Championship. Both men, thankfully, did make the weight here. Chamberlain came in a couple pounds below Lawrence Okoli. Firstly, let's just talk about the, the predictions. I went with Chamberlain to win on points. So did you, Ayers. And the listeners actually went with Okoli to win by knockout. The only situation I could not see happening was a Coley to win on points. I really couldn't see that happening. That's the only outcome. And when I was speaking to the other media after the fight, they all agreed. They said the only outcome we couldn't see happening was a Coley to win on points. And that is what ultimately happened. But the fight itself... Um, when Akoli walked to the ring, I mean, to say that he looked relaxed and to say that he looked comfortable coming out to the ring was an understatement. I mean... He was so, so confident. He jumped over the top rope. He was dancing. He completely, completely took the occasion in, whereas it was almost the complete opposite for Isaac Chamberlain. Um, you know, going into that fight as well, I, I, I was so invested emotionally in that fight. I had the shakes. I had sweaty palms. My heart was pumping. And like I say, Akoli was just raring to go. He was shadow boxing, standing in the middle of the ring. He was waiting for the referee's instructions. As soon as he got in the ring, he was literally stood in the middle, waiting for the referee to call both the fighters in. And, you know, he was stood there completely raring to go, Akoli. The first round, like I say... I mean, Akoli didn't show Chamberlain any respect whatsoever. He was letting the right hand go a lot, breaking up Isaac's guard, dropped him with a shot that, 
um, I've actually written here I need to see again and when I went home and watched it on TV I watched it back uh, you know the, the punch once again I don't really know what happened but he got caught with it and it was a 10-8 round it was a bit of a weird knockdown the second round obviously that's where Chamberlain had a point taken away which I thought was unbelievable the whole place erupted when that happened it was terrible terrible officiating I mean it's almost unforgivable he wasn't even warned to be honest um you know, at that point, I've, I've I've written down here that it was a mountain already for Chamberlain to climb after two 10-8 rounds, after just two rounds, both of those rounds in favour of Akoli. Um, Akoli, I thought, probably got the better of the action in that second round anyway, so I think he probably did enough to win that round without the point off, but it was what it was. The third round, it just seemed to me that the size was, was a huge factor, and that was really where Akoli started running away from it. He looked huge in there, he looked a much stronger man, he was so swarming Chamberlain and you know I wasn't sure at that point though if he could keep the work rate up it was quite a scrappy round but I think Akoli got the third round the fourth round however Chamberlain was holding his ground a bit more it was another scrappy round but I think the clean work came from Akoli but it was kind of turning more into Isaac's kind of fight a little bit scrappy I found that quite a close round the fourth um the fifth round, again, the re the referee at this point was being very, very lenient with Akoli. The, the crowd were booing as it was, uh, you know, there was there was lots and lots of holding going on most of the time. Akoli was initiating it. Again, I'd probably say Akoli won that fifth round. Nothing really clean, but Akoli just kept leaning all over Chamberlain. The referee wasn't doing anything about it. The sixth round, Isaac repeatedly was ducking into Lawrence's left hook. I don't know if you noticed that, but I saw that from where I was sitting. He kept ducking straight into Lawrence's left hook it was kind of like an upper hook I want to say it was in between like a left hook and a left uppercut and once again Isaac touched the canvas with his glove it was very unfortunate I don't think he was actually going to go down but his glove did touch the canvas so again it was another 10-8 round against him in the seventh round Akoli was happy to fight at range but every time Isaac got in close he would grab him, you know, and the referee still hadn't took a point at that stage at all. I think it was a really awful performance by the referee, but Isaac did land quite a few nice shots here and there. It was another close round. The eighth round, Chamberlain, you know, he seemed to come on quite strong in that eighth round, but again, the round was very, very close. It seemed to be too little too late at that stage. The ninth round, finally, the referee took a point away from Akoli in a round where I think that Akoli was probably just edging, so it was a 10-8 round in favour of Chamberlain, and I thought that that could perhaps spur him on. You know, in the final three minutes in that 10th round, he really did need a knockout, and he should have came out all guns blazing. In the 10th round, I think Isaac wasn't really allowed to work by Akoli. Akoli fought very, very cleverly, stuck to his game plan. Once the size became evident in the fight itself, the game plan that Akoli possessed was working well. And, you know, Isaac seemed like all he could really rely on was Akoli tiring in the later part of the fight, which didn't happen at all. And the two questions for me have now been answered. Akoli can do the rounds, and Akoli's obviously much better than most people gave him credit for, including myself. He looked really, really good. Like I say, once again, credit to Akoli for sticking to a very, very, very smart game plan. And, you know, that man seems to be the real deal to me, Ayaz. I don't know how you saw it. What can I say? Wow, well, um... I can I tell you one thing. It wasn't thing. a great fight. I've probably made it sound a little bit better than what it was, but you know. It wasn't a great fight, but I tell you what it was. It's basically if you look at this when you when you see when you see them at the start of the fight, look at the size difference between Akoli and Chamberlain. Akoli was so much bigger than Chamberlain, and in the whole fight, one thing I don't understand, Chamberlain was in front of no punches. One thing I can understand why he was in front of no punches is Akoli was bullying him throughout the whole fight. To be honest, um, Chamberlain is a small cruiserweight and Akoli is a very big, big cruiserweight. You can see it. You look at it, we can see the his physique like in the fight. He's got long reach. He's very big. Chamberlain in the fight here didn't even throw much punches here. Like, I, I thought, I, I said last week in the fight, in the show, I go, yeah, I, go, I think Chamberlain's going to outbox him and win him on points. But uh, we, because I thought it would be a Akoli knockout Chamberlain points. And I admit it myself, I said Chamberlain points. But fair place to Akoli, he won by points. But uh, well, you can see in the whole fight, like, Chamberlain only won, like, one or two rounds. But the rest went to Akoli. But in the whole fight, Akoli bullied Chamberlain from the start to the finish. But now, I want to see where did Chamberlain go from here. I think he needs to regroup and then go again. 
And I think Ocoli now, he'll go on for bigger and bigger, bigger things. And I think Chamberlain can do that as well. It's just because he's still young, it's still a learning game. And I think that Chamberlain can still come and come, come again. Yeah, I mean, I might have had it a little bit closer than others and probably it could have been a little bit biased on my part because, you know, I'm, I'm obviously quite good friends with Isaac. But for me, I actually had the fight 95-91 at the very end of proceedings in favour of Lawrence Ocoli. The reason why that score looks a little bit scrappy is because there was a few 10-8 rounds. Um, I've got to say, though, in the post-fight press conference, I was sat there and I was listening to Lawrence Ocoli and Lawrence Ocoli... He came across so, so well. Better than I've ever seen him come across before. Um, you know, he was saying that he hopes that the media online and, and the fans are not too harsh, um, you know, towards Isaac Chamberlain over Twitter and things like that. And I just thought that he didn't really need to say that, but he seemed like he went the extra mile, you know, to, to kind of be a good guy. And I'm not saying he hasn't done that before. Obviously, we know that there was a lot of... Or there was no love loss, I should say. But he seemed to really come across so well. And, you know, I really wish Akoli all the best. I think he really sets up some some really huge domestic fights down the line. And perhaps even further than that. I mean, I know that that's what he wants to do. And, of course, who am I to say he can't do that? But for me, he was really, really, really impressive. You know, as you say there, the size was such a factor. He was just bullying Akoli a little bit. And he stuck to a fantastic game plan. It's as simple as that. And one thing that I should have asked him in the post-fight press conference, but I didn't really get a chance to, is, Lawrence, did you learn more in that 10 rounds there against Isaac Chamberlain than you've learned in all of your other pro fights? And I'm pretty sure the answer would be yes. Even though he didn't have too much coming his way, there wasn't too much coming back at him, you know, the little things that Chamberlain does that are quite sneaky, I think that he dealt with those things very, very well. And like I say, credit to Lawrence Cody, man. I mean, he really come across good. And, you know, he certainly deserved the win. I remember in the build-up to the fight, though, Eddie Hearn said that there could be perhaps maybe a Coley Chamberlain 2 or 3 or even 4. I don't think that those fights are going to happen because it was quite one-sided. Um, one thing I will say, though, is this could be quite controversial, so I've got to watch what I'm saying here, but I think Isaac Chamberlain, obviously, is being trained by his uncle, who's a former professional boxer, Ted Bammy. Now, it seems like they've got a fantastic relationship. I think Ted Bammy doesn't take any crap from Chamberlain. I think that he, you know, he's the right man to motivate him and get him to work hard, and Chamberlain's always in phenomenal shape. But just like a training boxing brain, I don't know if Ted Bammy has the accomplishments well I know he doesn't have the accomplishments but I don't know what Isaac would be like if he was maybe perhaps with somebody like an Adam Booth or somebody like that I mean it may not work out but I'm just saying and it could be a little bit harsh because he's lost the fight and all of a sudden with you know we're pointing the finger at Ted that's not fair but what I'm saying is we've seen these relationships like a family trained boxer and sometimes it works really well sometimes it doesn't and I just don't know how much Ted knows about, you know, the tactical side of the game. Obviously, he was a good fighter himself, and he knows much more than I do. But what I'm saying is, I just don't know if what he'd be like or what he could do. I don't know if he'd be better off with somebody who, you know, has trained world champions time and time again and masterminded, you know, fantastic game plans. I don't know. But whatever he tried to do was negated by by, you know, Akoli's game plan. Akoli's game plan seemed to be a much cleverer, much smarter game plan than Chamberlain's one. That's just how it looked to me. So, um, yeah, I just wish Isaac all the very best. I truly do. Um, moving over now to the Bank of America Center in Texas, USA. This bill was shown on Box Nation a little bit later on in the night. We're going to start here with, on the undercard, Jose Benavidez. That's the brother of David Benavidez. We'll be speaking to David Benavidez in a few moments' time. Uh, yeah, so Jose Benavidez, he moved to 26-0. and 0. He got a TKO in the eighth and final round against Matthew Strode, who is 24-5. and 5. Also on the bill, Jesse Hart, former world title challenger. He moved to 23-1. and one. He looked quite good doing so. It was a KO in the very first round against Thomas Awimbono, who 
to be honest, had a bit of a padded record. He was 25-7 and seven with one draw. I didn't think that Jesse Hart really would take too long to dispatch of him, but a first-round knockout looks good either way. Um, Jerwin N. Cahas was on this bill as well. He picked up win number 29. He's got one loss and one draw. He defended successfully his IBF World Super Flyweight title against relatively unknown Israel Gonzalez, who I think was only 21 years of age. Um... Gonzalez was down in the first round, and I thought he was going to probably be quite an early night's work, to be honest, for Ancajas. But credit to Gonzalez, he stuck with it, and he's obviously got that tough Mexican spirit, that tough Mexican blood. And he went all the way to the 10th round, and he was down twice in the 10th round until the referee waved it off. So a stoppage win there for Ancajas, but not all that impressive, to be honest. And the main event, Gilberto Ramirez moved to 37-0, and if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken. I think that's the same amount of wins as Deontay Wilder, maybe one less win. So certainly one of the most, um, you know, the longest win streaks in boxing right now. He successfully defended his WBO World Super Middleweight title. It was a sixth round TKO against Habib Ahmed, who was relatively unknown. So much so that Steve Bunce was actually doing a competition of, you know, to send in who your most unknown world title challengers were from Britain. So. Obviously, loads of people entered. I had some good entries, actually. But yeah, Habib Ahmed actually lost his O here, unfortunately. He's now 25-1 and one with one draw. Extremely padded record. I'm not quite sure how he ended up in the top 15. But a really easy win there for Gilberto Ramirez. And I think it's the first time he's got a stoppage win in quite a few fights in a row. So, credit to Gilberto Ramirez. They showed a short little clip just before the fight. They showed it on Box Nation. And I thought it was quite interesting. Gilberto Ramirez actually says that when he was growing up, he wanted to be a gangster or a hitman. And boxing saved him. And now, all of a sudden, um, I think he also got involved in like a car crash or something where he nearly died. And now, he's become... You know, one of the, um, you know, a world champion and one of the guys with the longest win streaks in boxing. So, unbelievable story from uh, Gilberto Ramirez from the slums of Mexico. And moving over now to a final build that I think happened in Japan. I think it was on Sunday. Daigo Higa successfully defended his WBC World Flyweight title. He moved to 15-0 and with 15 knockouts, if I'm not mistaken. He beat Moises Fuentes, who was 25-4, and now 25-5 and with one draw. And it was a very, very quick win. A first round KO for Daigo Higa. He successfully defended his WBC World Flyweight title. Once again, Daigo Higa from Japan. A very, very exciting fighter can certainly certainly punch which is fantastic for the flyweight division we shall see him hopefully down the line with our very own andrew selby at some point but that really wraps up the review and it's now time to welcome yet another world champion to the box heart podcast Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated WBC super middleweight champion of the world. But not only that, he's also the youngest man to ever win a super middleweight world title in the history of the sport. It's, of course, Mr. David Benavidez. David, welcome to the show. Hello, man. Uh, You know, I just want to thank you for, you know, giving me this time to do this interview. I really appreciate it. No worries, my friend. We've had you on before, and it's a pleasure to have you back. So, David, when we last spoke, it was back in August of last year, just before your fight for the world title. You took on, obviously, Ronald Gavril on September the 8th at the Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas. Now, you ended up winning the fight by a split decision after 12 rounds, despite being dropped yourself for the first time in your career in round 12. So, there's a few talking points there, David. Firstly, obviously, you walked right into a stiff jab from Gavril in that 12th round you seem to be a little bit off balance when you got up it was clear to see that you weren't really hurt by the shot am I wrong in any of that were you hurt at all and what was you thinking as well when you actually hit the canvas for the first time in your career you know I, I wasn't hurt at all in that fight you know if you if you're watching the fight closely I was I had taken over from the 10th all the way to the 12th round until I had got dropped you know I was just trying to close the show but um you know, in fights like that, you can't really leave yourself open like that. I was switching from lefty, you know, my lefty stance to the right stance. You know, I just got a little bit too careless, and I got caught with a little shot. It was more off balance than anything, but I wasn't hurt at all you know, when I got up. And, you know, I still felt like I did enough to win the fight. 
Yeah, it didn't. I mean, to me, it didn't seem like you were hurt. To be honest, I think some people were, you know, making out that you seemed to be more hurt than what you were. Um, obviously, the fact that it was a split decision is another talking point. Judge Adelaide Bird scored it one sixteen one eleven in your favour. Uh, Dave Moretti scored it 117-111 in your favour and obviously Glenn Trowbridge scored it 111-116 in favour of Ronald Gavril. so two judges pretty much scored it the same to you and one judge scored it exactly the other way round. A lot of people believe that the rounds were very close. Did you believe the fight was a close fight? Did you expect the scores to be all close together? Uh, you know, Or did you think that you won clearly that, that, that fight there? You know, I felt like I had won. I won the fight clearly. Um, you know, everything he was throwing, I was blocking him. You know, I felt like I kept the pace. I was working my jab. You know, I landed the cleaner shots, but it was a close fight. You know, I, I felt like I had won most of the rounds. Maybe he had won three or four, but I felt like I did enough to win most of the rounds. You know, but um, in close fights like that, you know, it was it was a really good fight. You know, and uh, and I'm glad to have this you know this opportunity to have this rematch. You know, I feel like I'm just going to give the fans another great fight. Yeah, so you think the two scorecards that came in that were in your favor, you think those scorecards were pretty much on the ball sort of thing? They were right? Yeah, yeah, I felt like they were right. I, okay. I, like Honestly, I felt like I did uh, more. I landed more and I kept the control and the pace of the fight better. So I felt like, I, I you know, those scorecards were right. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, as you say there, the rematch is back on. It's set for February 17th, only a few days away now at the Mandalay Bay. This time, however, David, you now know Ronald Gavril very well. You've done the 12 rounds with him. You know what to expect. You certainly know he's quite a tough guy. And judging by the tweets that I've seen you send out on Twitter, you've said a few times, including once to Leonard Ellaby, that this time you're going to knock Ronald Gavril out. What things do you feel that you You've got to do differently to do something this time that you were unable to do last time. You know, um, the the training camp, everything from you know the training camp to the game plan is way different. Everything is different. You know, you know, obviously the the stakes are the stakes are higher. The venue is bigger. You know, on on, a, on the big undercard of Brandon Rios and Danny Garcia. You know, so I'm I'm extremely motivated for this fight. You know, I have three months training for this camp. You know, I'm working with uh, Alex Ariza. You know, and everything's been different for this camp. And I kind of know this. I kind of know what Ronald Gavril is bringing to the table. You know, I, I feel like he's, you know, a, kind of a one-trick type of pony type of guy that he does the same thing over and over again. You know, and me, I'm a little bit more versatile. I can do different things. So for this fight, you know, we have a game plan set already. You know, and then um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great fight. You know what I mean? I'm I'm expecting it to be a war. You know, they've been talking a lot of trash, saying they felt like they've won the fight. But I'm extremely ready for this. This is exactly what I want. And I want this to be a war. And that's exactly what we're going to make it. And I'm going to win this fight by knockout. And after feeling Ronald Gavril's power, getting to know what his stamina's like, getting to know what his jab is like, his movement, all the rest of it, if you could give us give us a percentage of how confident you are that you will stop Gavril this time round, what would that percentage be out of 100, obviously? I feel like I'm in a 90% right now. You know, I've trained very hard for this fight. You know, I've, I've, I've done everything in my power, in my power to make, you know, to... To give myself the best percentage to knock this guy out, you know. So I feel very confident in all the work we've done for this fight, and um, yeah, I'll say like I'm at like at a ninety percent. Okay, I very, feel like I'm gonna knock him out. Yeah, very honest of you to say so. There also, the WBO World Super Middleweight Title um, was obviously defended successfully on the weekend. Just gone, Gilberto Ramirez knocked out Hab- Habib Ahmed. I think it's said in round six. Were you impressed at all by that? Did you watch it at all? I was actually there because my brother had he had fought in the same night. Oh, of course. Of but you course, know, um, of course. yeah, uh, I felt like Suda Ramirez did what he had to do. You know, it was a good fight. You know, he kept the P. He wasn't really tested in the fight as much. So, you know, I think he should have taken the guy out earlier. But as far as the fight with Suda Ramirez goes, you know, I still have my job to take care of on February 17th. But I feel like that's a fight. That's a great fight for the fans, you know, and just for us. You know, I worked with Suda Ramirez. He's a good friend of mine, you know. But like I said, you know, we all want to be the best. You know, there's no friendships in boxing. And I have to face the best to prove to myself that I am the best. You know, so hopefully in the future that fight could happen. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask you if you've sparred him, but obviously you've just answered that there. Um, also, I want to ask you, because we haven't spoke since James DeGaulle lost his, his world title to Caleb Truax. Did you happen to see that? It seemed to be a weird, re- really, really weird performance by James DeGaulle and a brilliant win, of course, for Truax. Yeah, I, I, I had seen the fight. You know, I paid very close attention to that fight because, you know, um, he said that he was supposed to face me after the fight, you know, saying that he had sp- spoken to Al Heyman and they had promised him the fight. You know, so I played close attention to that fight, but I think he was maybe thinking about me a little bit more than he was about his opponent. You know what I mean? He should have worked a little bit harder and defended his title first before he could think of anything else. You know, but, you know, hats off to, you know, to, to Truax. He had trained hard, you know, and he was relentless. He was constant with that pressure, you know, and he took the belt away from, you know, um, uh, Degel. And I heard there's going to be a rematch, you know, so if I handle my fight good, which I know I am, you know, hopefully I could get the winner of that fight. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And I want to ask you about uh, about a potential fight in the future. Again, obviously we're not going to look or, or overlook Gavril at all, but providing you get through this fight, who would you be looking at? I mean, you mentioned Gilberto Ramirez there. You mentioned perhaps the winner out of Degao and Truax in the rematch, but is there one name out of all the bunch that you're really focused on that that's the one you want next more than the others? You know, honestly, like I said, I have to take care of this fight first, but, you know, I'm I'm more than confident that I'm going to come out this fight with a victory, you know, and a, a spectacular win. Um, I want What I want next is James Degao. You know what I mean? Just because he had said, you know, this is just a lot of, there's a lot of, it's gonna be, it would be a great fight. So for him, for that to happen, you know, I feel like he has to win this fight first. And, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe I could go to England, you know, and, and uh, you know, I would go, I would be more than, more than uh, fine with going to his hometown, you know, and making that a good fight. Because, you know, I would love to fight in England because the fights over there, you know, the boxing shows get sold out quick, you know, so, it would be it would it would be an amazing fight, you know. Not I feel like I'm a world champion. I'm, you know, I'm all with it, all for it to go into anybody's backyard and defend my title and to take another title. Very well said, very well said. And also on the same night as yourself, but a few hours earlier. So I don't think you're probably going to be able to watch it live, unfortunately. But George Groves takes on Chris Eubank Jr. Is that a fight that interests you at all? Oh, yes, yes. That, I didn't know it was the same day, actually. I thought it was, like, next week. But, yeah, that fight, of course. Um, you know, hopefully, like I said, you know, I'm in a position right now where I could get these great fights and I can make, I can make you know, the, the, the boxing fans, you know, very satisfied because I could fight all these great fighters. I'm in the position now where I want to be, where, where I could prove myself and to the fans that I'm the best champion out there. So, me, hopefully, you know, you know, that would be a fight we can make happen in the future, too. Um, you know, that's going to be an amazing fight. You know, both fighters are amazing, Groves and Earbanks, you know, so I'm looking forward to seeing that one as well. Do you have any kind of favor in that fight who you think could perhaps win it? You know, both guys, you know, they're, what are they, both like 29, close to 30. I feel like they have a lot of experience, you know, but um, Earbanks has been looking impressive, and George Groves, you know, he's, he's just had so much so much uh so much experience in there but you know it's not really up to me i wouldn't pick any of you guys you know it's really up to them whoever wants it more but it's going to be an amazing fight that's for sure yeah we certainly hope so it's going to be a great super middleweight night obviously over here and over in the states including yourself in that um when we last spoke also it was just before the canelo versus golovkin fight but you know obviously we know what happened there the rematch is now set for may 5th will you be going into camp with any of those guys and also this is kind of three questions in one who won the last fight in your opinion and who wins the rematch come uh, may 5th um you know as to going to the camp with any of them you know i'm very open you know like i said before i like working with great fighters because you know it helps me learn a lot for myself you know and it's just it's just getting that experience working with great champions like that you know what i mean but um as for the first fight, I thought Golovkin won. I feel like Canelo had, you know, the tools to beat him. You know, he looked sharp. You know, his reflexes were fast. But, you know, Golovkin's power, you know, kind of, it overcame him, you know, that pressure as well. And the jab, he stuck to the jab and he did his job. So I felt like Golovkin won. I feel like the first fight is going to be a little bit of the, the second fight is going to be a little bit of the same with the first fight. You know, but maybe if Canelo steps it up, if he sees some things that he didn't see in the first fight, it can it can maybe uh, go in Canelo's favor. But it's going to be an amazing fight. You know, I'm I'm looking forward to that too. 
Yeah, I think we all are. I think we all are, to be honest. It's a fantastic fight. Um, and also, your brother Jose Benavidez was involved in some kind of altercation the other day with Terence Crawford. Obviously, videos were going all over the internet. What actually happened there? Um, I wasn't there, actually. I was I was still uh, right in Las Vegas. I had not went after that. But, you know, them, them guys, my brother and Terence Crawford, you know, they kind of have like a little beef going on. You know what I mean? Uh, when my brother was at 140... He was supposed to fight Crawford. You know, I think they got the fight like twice, you know, but for some reason that fight didn't happen. And, you know, just they, they just been trash talking ever since. So kind of when they seen each other, you know what I mean? I think Terrence Crawford said something. My brother's not the type of dog, type of guy to back down from anything, you know, and they, they, they just got into it. I think I feel like it's, it's good motivation for my brother. You know, if my brother keeps doing his job, he keeps looking good in these fights, maybe he could get that fight. You know what I mean? He just has to work hard. And I feel like that's exactly what my brother's going to do. Maybe he'll get that fight in the future, and it'll be great. It'll be great for him. And Terrence Crawford actually tweeted, uh, I think I'm going to take it out of context a little bit here because I can't remember word for word, but he said something along the lines of, David is the only Benavidez that can fight. So there was a little bit of a compliment there for you, I suppose. But did that surprise you when he tweeted that? Um, that's the first time I actually hear that. You know, um, you know, I just let them talk. I really don't pay too much attention to them. You know, if... The, if, you know, I tell my brother, you know, if he really wants to beat this guy, use that to his advantage to motivate him so he could go in the gym and work like an animal, you know what I mean? That's kind of, that's up to them, you know, it's, it's really out of my hands, you know, because it's not, it has nothing to do with me. Until he is, until he says something bad or says, you know, puts my name, you know, like, says something bad about me, then I'll get into it, you know, but I, I just don't pay attention to it right now. Nah, fair enough. But like I say, he kind of... I suppose had a little bit of a dig at your brother, but then also gave you a compliment. It was a funny, it was a funny tweet, to be honest. Um, your last question now that I've got for you, David. Just before I let you go, I just want to ask you your prediction for your upcoming fight. Obviously, you've said that you're ninety percent sure you're going to go in there and knock him out. That is the aim. We're expecting a bit of a war here, but do you have any kind of, you know, idea when this knockout can perhaps come? Whether it's going to be late, whether it's going to be early, or perhaps you'd rather not say. You know, at first, I'm going to go in there, you know, and I'm going to do my job. You know, I'm not going to rush in looking for anything. You know, I'm just going to do work, you know, do what I have to do, you know. Um, until I see the holes in Gravel, then I'm going to take advantage of those, you know. I'm not going to press nothing until I see a weakness in Gravel, until I see him tire out. But like I said, you know, he's been talking about me. I've been talking about him. So I don't want to see this fight. I don't want it to go to the, to the cards again and then them saying they won. You know what I mean? So... I'm not going to leave it up to the judges. I've been very motivated this whole camp, you know, just kind of using their trash talk as uh, as in, in my favor for motivation, you know, waking up in the morning, pushing everything to the limit, you know, pr- pushing it past the limit, working harder than the next, than the day before. So, um, you know, I don't know what round, but there's going to be a knockout in this fight. You know what I mean? I'm very, very extremely confident in this fight that I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win by knockout in this fight, and I'm gonna steal the show the night of the the, the February seventeenth. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Listen, David, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my friend. You know that. We wish you the best of luck for February seventeenth, and we'll catch up sometime after. I'm sure. Okay. Thank you, sir, very much for this interview, and I really appreciate it. Have a nice night. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Just before we get into the previewing, we're going to go over to Ayaz with the latest boxing news. Ayaz, take it away. Kez Ashfaq has signed with Matram Boxing. Yes, obviously, Ashfaq, I think he... Was he at the 2016 Olympics, Ayaz, or have I got that horribly wrong? Correct. 2016 Olympics. Yeah. Um, I don't think... Well, I think he maybe went out in the first round or something, but, you know, he was he was there anyway. He's an Olympian. Um, I think he signed originally with Haymaker Ringstar, and for whatever reason did a U-turn on that, and now he's with Matram. Um, I don't really care who he ends up with. I just want to see him fight, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I'm happy that he's signed a promotional contract, and hopefully we see him in the ring uh, sooner rather than later. Conor Ben has signed a two-year uh, extension with Matram Boxing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not really a big shock to me. I, I always thought that they'd stay with him, certainly, um, you know, certainly because he's such a big name despite not really beating anybody just yet, and I'm sure he'd admit that himself. Yeah, he's he's a name, and, and that's about all he is at the moment. I mean, hopefully he makes a name for himself rather than, you know, being under his, his father's shadow. But, yeah, he's, he's, he's a good fighter. I wouldn't say he's a great boxer, but... Um, 
Yeah, I mean, in that last fight against against that guy from France, he, he seemed to just completely forget all of his boxing skills and have a complete tear up, and it well, it almost went awfully wrong. To be honest, he he really should have a loss on his record. But yeah, credit to Conor Ben. I'm you know I'm not going to jump on him and start saying he's he's not going to be this good and he's not going to be that good. There's no point. I mean, he's a Brit and. All the very best to him, and hopefully we see him in a few a few good fights. Hopefully he gets a few good wins and he improves. David Price's next fight will be against Alexander Povetkin. Yeah, that one, of course, set to happen on the Joshua Parker undercard in Cardiff on March 31st. A bit of a crazy fight, to be honest. I put a tweet out the other day, and I just kind of realised, like, wow, um... David Price, obviously he lost the fight to Chris, uh, to Christian Hammer. He lost that fight, fair enough. Um, I don't think Christian Hammer failed any kind of drugs test at any point in his career. I'm not quite sure, but I know that he lost, of course, to Erkan Tepper, and he got done for, for, for juicing, and then he lost also twice to Tony Thompson, and there's all sorts of rumours that he got done for juicing. I remember when Tony Thompson come on our show, he said that it wasn't quite like that, and sometimes it's not, but... Regardless of what happened and what didn't happen, he's lost to drug cheats. And now, he's taking on another drug cheat. So, I mean, not only that, but obviously Povetkin's much more than just a drug cheat. He's a really, really good fighter. Um, You know, he seemed to be a little bit average since he stopped juicing, but he still is a really good fighter. He's still, I'd say, probably in the top five um, heavyweights in the world. And I think that Povetkin will stop David Price, unfortunately, um, quite early, probably within three or four rounds. I, I'd be very shocked if, if Price saw round five. I just think it's all wrong for him. Obviously, um, not only is he one of the best heavyweights in the world, Povetkin, but David Price has got confidence issues. Okay, So I don't know who's handling David Price or who is signing you know, this deal for him or whatever it is. I know that David Price can punch, but that's about it, right? I like David Price, but let's be honest. The guy has got confidence issues, and we're actually going to try and give him a chance against Povetkin in front of 80,000 people. I mean, if he's got... Confidence issues fighting in front of a few thousand. Can you imagine eighty thousand? It's just, I'm. I really hope I'm wrong. I'd love Price to knock him out, but this is a humongous ask. And to be honest, I hope he's getting well paid because I think he's going to get knocked out brutally. So um, if the odds shorten, if the odds are quite nice, then I will certainly be lumping something quite big on Povetkin to win within four rounds because I see that as a foregone conclusion completely. But um, I'm sorry if I'm offending any Price fans because, you know, I'm just being real. I, I just can't see him doing this. It's, it's very unfortunate. It's, it's, it's hopefully just a fight um, that he's getting paid well for. And I can't, I, I just don't think anybody truly believes he's going to win this fight. Probably even himself, you know. So, oh, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Is that it for the news, guys, or is there any more? That's it for the news. Okay, short and sweet. Right, later tonight, Roy Jones Jr., will be in his final fight. So by the time you've listened to this podcast, you may have um you may have already, you know, seen his fight or heard the result or whatever, but right now he hasn't got in the ring yet. He'll be in the ring in a matter of hours. Well, anyway, his record 65 and 9. He fights for the vacant WBU German version in brackets cruiserweight title. He takes on Scott Sigmund who's 30 and 11 with one draw. Obviously Roy Jones Jr. has been a fantastic fighter, you know, arguably one of the best of our era to be honest. He's gone on um, quite quite a bit too far. Everybody can tell you that, including Enzo Macronelli who knocked him out. Enzo Macronelli quite quite honestly said that I would I wouldn't have really been able to live with him at all if he was a few years younger. Um But yeah, he's gone on too long, and thankfully he's going to be calling it a day. It's going to be his 75th professional fight. Um, I think he's actually promoting the show as well, so he could be quite a busy man this evening. I know that he's done lots and lots and lots of interviews. Um, So yeah, hopefully, you know, he's hopefully goes out on a high and gets a win here. But I wouldn't be surprised. You just never know with Roy Jones. Sometimes he can fight good. Sometimes he can get knocked out by somebody who's not so good. So. 
All the very best to Roy Jones Jr. once again. We hope he can go out with a W to his name here. Uh, That one, by the way, is at the Civic Center in his hometown of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, Moving over now to Mexico. One fight to mention over here. Miguel Bichelt, he defends his WBC World Super Featherweight title against Maxwell Awuku, who's 44 and 3 with one draw. Miguel Bichelt, 32 and 1. Uh, that one's going to be on ESPN, by the way. I don't think they're showing it in the UK. Um, I've got to look more at Maxwell Awuku's record. I haven't seen or heard of him, to be honest. I could be, uh, I could be wrong. Maybe he's fought someone, but I can't really remember off the top of my head. Um, flying through this now because I know that we've got places to be. Moving over to Poland. Christoph Waladzik, he's on this bill, 53 and 4 with one draw. Of course, he just got knocked out a few months ago by Gassiev. I think it was in two rounds or something like that. He's back in an eight rounder against a guy called Adam Gadaju, who is 17 and 14. Really, really big mismatch there. Um,. Also, Christoph Glowacki, the former WBO Cruiserweight World Champion, the guy that lost his title to Usyk just before this tournament started. I'm sure he'd be pinching himself or kicking himself, I should say, because Glowacki would have certainly been in this tournament and he would have been getting some really big paydays. But anyway, he's not. And he's actually in an eight-rounder here against a guy called Manroy Siddiqui, who's 14-1 and one with one draw. That's an eight-rounder. Glowacki, 28-1. and one. All the best to those guys in Poland. Moving over now to Mexico once again. There's not too much on, to be honest, so we're scraping the barrel a little bit. Miguel Roman, he's had 70 fights. He's fighting once again. His record's 58-12. and 12. It's for the vacant WBC United States Silver Super Featherweight title, despite the fight not even being in the United States. It's happening in Mexico. <laughs> Go figure that. It's a 10-rounder, and he takes on Aristides Perez, who's 31 and 10 with two draws. Unbelievable. And moving over to the final bill to mention now, if I'm not mistaken, over in the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. Two fights to mention on this bill. Hassim Rekman Jr., that's the uh, you know the son of Hassim Rekman, the former heavyweight world champion. He takes on a guy called Saba Pavai, who's 1 and 2, obviously a losing record, but Every fight he's been in, he's, you know, the fight's ended in knockout. So he's, like I say, his record's one and two. He knocked a guy out in his win and he got knocked out twice in his two losses. Hassim Rekman, 3 0 with three first round knockouts. So one thing is for sure, this will be an early one. It's scheduled for four rounds. I don't think it will see the final bell, that one. Hassim Rekman looking very good. Again, I told the story a few weeks back when Hassim Rekman showed up for a fight and his opponent was in the ring and actually done a runner and left the venue without fighting bizarre bizarre stuff but the main event over there actually Henry Lundy also known as Hank Lundy 28 and 6 with one draw he's in an 8 rounder against former world champion former opponent of Floyd Mayweather Demarcus Corley 50 wins and 28 losses now with one draw this is going to be his 80th fight Demarcus Corley so all the very best to both men I like him a lot and the final bill to mention is actually happening next Tuesday which is the day before Valentine's Day Tuesday Tuesday the 13th of February. By the time the show goes out next week, this fight would have concluded. Um, It's going to be happening at the Sands Bethlehem Event Center in Pennsylvania, USA. Two fights to mention on this bill. Michael Fox, 15 and 0. He takes on Ricardo Garcia, who's 14 and 1. Michael Fox is the brother of Alantis Fox. Um, the guy that lost recently to Demetrius Andrade. But yeah, Michael Fox, I think he's only 140 or 147. He's like six foot three. He's a complete freak of nature. So all the best to Michael Fox. Uh, I think his nickname's The Professor as well, which I really quite like. That's an eight rounder there. And the main event over here, former world champion Kermit Cintron, 39 and six with three draws, takes on George Sosa, who's 15 and 11 with one draw. That's a 10 rounder there. So all the very best to Kermit Cintron, another fight that for me has gone on a little bit too long. It seems to be the theme this week. It seems to be the fashion lately, but that's what it is. It's boxing. We love it. It's crazy, and we love it more. But that's really it for the preview, and we've done the reviewing. We've done the news. We brought you the very first guess. It's now time, just before we wrap up part two, we've just done the previewing as well, but it's now time to bring in our second and final guest. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated super lightweight contender ranked number two in the world by the WBC. It's, of course, Mr. Regis Progre. Regis, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on. Hey, it's my pleasure, sir. It's my pleasure. So, Regis, I'd like to give our listeners a little bit of a backstory on how you got into boxing. You're probably the only fighter to ever become a boxer pretty much because of a hurricane. Please explain more. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm, I wouldn't say I became a boxer because of hurricane, but it enhanced everything, you know. So I was, I was basically, I started fighting. Um, I started boxing like maybe three months before Hurricane Katrina hit. Um, but it wasn't, it basically, it wasn't the real stuff. So I guess, I, I guess you can't say I started boxing because of hurricane. But anyways, um, you know, Hurricane Katrina hit. You know, I moved around a couple of times. I mean, I think I counted like sixteen different times. We moved everywhere from state to state in different cities. And uh, we eventually, you know, my mama, she she came back. She was, we was living in Houston at first, and then we left. And she went to um, Atlanta. And then um, I went to Slidell with my grandparents. And eventually my mom moved back to Houston, and she wanted me and my sister with her. So um, that's what we did. We moved to Houston, finally moved to Houston and stayed in Houston. And, um, you know, and then I went to Savannah's boxing gym. And, you know, the rest is history, man. I just, you know, I, I it was just, I loved it, you know, but um, you know, I started I started in New Orleans, but it just everything just changed, of course, because of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, I think you should um you should definitely uh, you know, stay sort of connected with a hurricane. It's quite a funny story. I like the uh the the, the little caption. It sounds good. It sounds a lot better. It's good to uh, it's good to be interested, yeah. they say. Um yeah. and also, and I've got to ask you this Regis and I want to hear you do this one day when you've had a big fight, a big win, when all the other boxers say I'd like to thank Al Heyman. If you thank H- Hurricane Katrina, that will be golden, my friend. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to thank a couple of people, but yeah, I definitely would thank Hurricane Katrina, you know. Um, so yeah, let me get the world, let me get the world title first, and then yeah, that's who I'll be thanking. <laughs> Obviously, you say there you moved to Texas in the end, and when you moved to Texas, you were able to spend some quality time with Evander Holyfield. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was. Um, I mean, I just you know I was seventeen at the time, and I was you know I was hitting bags, and you know Holyfield's next to me hitting the bag, hitting the heavy bag next to me. You know, so that definitely does something to your mind as a seventeen year old. You know, and um, just and not even him. You know, at the time Juan Diaz was, you know, he was one of the big fighters. You know, so he was there. Juan Diaz, Rocky Juarez, Raul Marquez, um, Irisline De Laura, um, Gilbert Rigondeaux, and um, the Tra- me and the Charlo twins. We all came up together. You know, and um, it, so yeah, it was just all those like that. All that talent came out of one little spot, one little hot spot gym. You know, um, so yeah, but yeah, man, it's, it just. You know, being around Holyfield, you know, hitting the bag, training next to him, it just, it, it definitely does something to your mind when you're a 17 year old kid. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You mentioned Juan Diaz there. He's a guy that has been on this show previously also. Um, I just want to quickly revisit your last win, Regis. It was against, obviously, Joel Diaz Jr., who was unbeaten, mm-hmm. 23-0. and And that fight was supposed to be the toughest fight of your career. But to be honest, you made it look like one of your easiest. You absolutely hammered um, Diaz Jr., knocking him down four times in the second round. And at that point, the referee had seen enough. What a win, by mm-hmm. the way. How did you assess that performance? Very explosive. Um, I mean, well, really, the the, the the funny thing about that win is that, you know, the whole fight is that I didn't want to take that fight. I did not want to take that fight because it, it was on Showbox, and I was just, you know, I told my promoter, I'm past Showbox. I didn't want to take the fight, um, you know, because the money wasn't right, and, you know, it was just all kinds of things. And I just I just felt like it was a chip on my shoulder, you know. So, um. Yeah, I, I didn't want to take it, you know. So, of course, you know, I, I negotiated a little bit. They brought the money up, and I was like, you know what, all right, let me go ahead and take the fight. And I was like, look, I just had a chip on my shoulder. Like, I have to destroy this dude. Like, I have to, you know, just run through him because if not, you know, you never know what happens. So, yeah, I just I went out there, and I, I just – but I think he fought a bad fight because his thing was he wanted to come and he wanted to come and fight me in – if people don't know, that's what I love to do. Like I'm, I'm a natural fighter. I'm not. I can, I can box. I can be slick. I can move my head and give some defense. And you know, I and and I, I think I have a, a good boxing IQ. But naturally, I'm a fighter. I'm more of a fighter than anything else. And he he tried to come. He tried to come out too strong. And 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 then once he tasted my power, that was it. It was just. It was kind of the you know the beginning of the end. You know. So um, after the first round. 
right when the, the bell, if you if you go back and watch that fight, right at the bell of the first round, um, I hit him with a a, a left hand to the body, and he kind of he kind of made the ugh. He was just I, I heard it. I was like, that I got him, but the bell rang. Um, and then I went back to my corner. I told my I told my coach Bobby. I was like Bobby, look, I got him. He's hurt. So I look. I'm in my my coach was like, look, chill out. You know, you got a long time to go. This is just the first round. Like, chill, you know, chill out. You can you can box him, do some other things. I was like, look, I got him hurt. And when I know people, when I know I have somebody hurt, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna finish him. You know. So I was like, Bobby, look, I got him. He's hurt. So you know, second round, I just went out. I just I blessed him, and you know that was it. Yeah, it certainly was it. It certainly was it. And obviously, your next fight is set for March the 9th in South Dakota. I want to I wanna ask you, um, also, it's going to be on Showtime, uh, I should mention, in the United States. I've got to ask you, though, why South Dakota? It seems like a very random place for the fight to take place. Um, You know what? That's something um, you got to ask my promoter. You know, um, that's where they put it. At. I feel like they need a neutral place. Um. You know, because he's from Ukraine, I'm from New Orleans slash Houston, so they can't bring it to the South because there will be a lot of people here. And um, I don't know, I think he has, he probably has some fans, you know, Russian or Ukrainian fans in, um, up in New York or something like that. So, I, I mean, I guess that's where they brought it, South Dakota. I don't know. You know, I, I know they have some pretty cool history in South Dakota. I don't know too much about it. I know that's what Wild Bill, I think I killed that or something like that. All the Wild Wild West, it was lawless in the 1800s. And um, I think it was like a lot of gold was there. That's why a lot of people migrated there. But um, as far as like the fight going, I I mean I don't know. I don't, you know, I I don't know why they put it in South Dakota. I've never even been there before, you know. So it'll be it'll be cool to go somewhere I've never been there. Yeah, it may have a bit of history. It doesn't have much boxing history in the state of South Dakota. I think um, it's had something like 16, maybe 17 fights take place there. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. cards, I should say. Like a whole bill take place there in history, like over 100 years. The last notable yeah. person, the last notable person to fight there was, funny enough, the current um, IBF super middleweight world champion, Caleb Truax. He fought there almost 10 years ago. I think it was his ninth pro fight. A little fact there for the listeners. Um, as we know, you're taking on the former WBC super lightweight champion, Victor Postel. Victor Postel is best known probably for stopping Lucas Matisse, but in his very next fight, he, of course, lost the title to Terence Crawford. Now, this fight will be for the interim WBC world title. The strange thing to me about this fight, Regis, is that obviously you're going to be fighting for the interim title whilst the WBC full title is vacant. It seems quite unusual. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you know, it would surely make more sense to me and you if number one and two both fought each other for the full title and then maybe for the interim number three and four could fight each other but instead it's it's kind of mixed up obviously you're going to be taking on the the fourth ranked guy and the the first and third will be fighting for the full title do you know why that's happened it seems a bit bizarre um it's just i mean i feel there's just a lot of politics into it you know um yeah it it, it is kind of messed up and things like that but it's you know it's okay um it's it's politics that's that's just how it goes it's, it's a lot of politics you know um uh amir mine he's ranked number one how i don't know he was ranked number one for a while you know he got knocked out by adrian granados and then he fought you know two nobodies after that you know he just fought two nobodies off tv after that and meanwhile I've been fighting undefeated fighters. I just fought Joe Diaz and beat him he's an undefeated fighter you know um and then you have um ramirez and you know, he he hasn't really fought anybody either, you know, to be honest. You know, he has – I won't say he has a padded record, but he hasn't fought anybody of my caliber, you know, in their fighting for the title. Um, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I really don't worry about it because at the same time, I'm me and Postal fighting for the interim title. And I think Postal is one of the – I think Postal is, you know, one of the best in the world at 140. And I'm, I love competition. That's why I'm, I'm glad they – you know, they announced that fight because I, after my after the fight against Joe Diaz, I called out three names. I called out Victor Postal, Terrence Crawford, and Adrian Broner. And, you know, Postal was one of them. So I, I guess I got my wish. You know, I want to fight the best. So I don't even consider Amir Mine and um, Jose Ramirez nowhere close to being the best in the division. So it's it's in, it's, it's going to be, no, be for interim title. So they'll have to fight me eventually. But, you know, to answer, like I said, to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's definitely um it's just politics you know it comes with the game it's politics and Jose Ramirez is from um somewhere I forgot somewhere in California and he, he sells a lot a lot of tickets so that's a big part of it also you know um you know I know he has a he definitely has a bigger name than I do so as far as ticket sales go so 
I think that's that's a reason that you know they did that. You know, so but you know it's okay, it's cool. Yeah, you mentioned there about you know Amir Imam's sort of resume and also Ramirez's, and not to go off topic, I think Ramirez's last win was really quite impressive against Mike Reed. That was just the way mm-hmm. I saw it. I thought that was quite a good win. But yeah, back to you know back to what we're here about, Victor Postel. Um, what do you know about your opponent, Regis? Obviously, um, like I say, we've seen him on the world scene. He's mixed it at a very high level, and he is a solid fighter. Obviously, just the one loss and to Crawford, there's no shame in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, as far as studying people, I don't study. I, I never study fighters. But, you know, from what I know about him, I mean, I've seen, of course, I've seen the Matisse fight. That was an excellent win for him to win a belt. And, you know, I've seen a Crawford fight, you know. But as far as everything else, I don't know too much about him. I like to just go out and, you know, first round, I like to try to figure people out. And first, you know, first couple of rounds, two or three rounds, then, you know, find them out and, and see what I need to do. But as far as, like, his style, I mean, he's a – he, he, I feel like he, he's definitely, he definitely has more experience than I have. You know, he has what thirty fights. Um, you know, he had twenty nine, thirty fights or something like that. You know, so he had, he definitely has more experience. Um, maybe his ring IQ, his ring IQ is high. He's a tall, rangy, lanky fighter, and he has deceptive power. I wouldn't say he has a lot of power, but he has deceptive power. You know, he can, you know, he knocked, he stopped Matisse. You know, so um, that's that's the main things that I know about him. You know, I'm not really. I don't like I said I don't really study him. I don't I don't I feel I don't need to study him. That's what my trainers are there for, you know. So I'm going to just do what I got to do and you know and just, you know, go that's it. Just show up and do what I got to do. And in Postel's last fight, he fought an unbeaten southpaw like yourself and took his O. Now, he was also dropped along the way. Obviously, your style is probably nothing like his last opponent. And one thing I'm pretty sure about is that you certainly hit harder. Do you believe if you're to hit... Victor Postel clean, Regis, that you'd keep him on the on the floor? I think so, yes. That's one thing I think so. You know, we're going 12 rounds. We fight for a belt, so we're going 12 rounds. I, I don't think he – I don't think he'll be able to not get hit by me flush for 12 rounds. And I know I do hit hard. You know, my style is not to go – like I said, I can't box, but my style is to go destroy my opponent. I want to go hurt my opponent, you know, and, and destroy my opponent. So I don't think – I, like I said, I don't think that if 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 I drop him, I don't think he'll be able to get up. And if he gets up, I think it'll be worse for him to get up because I think I'll finish him off. You know, so um, yeah, and 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 so that's what I that's what I know about him that he does get he does get buzzed, he gets he gets hurt, he gets dropped. He got hurt against Mathi, he got wobbled against Mathise, he got dropped against Terrence Crawford, he got dropped against his last you know his last um opponent. So I feel like you know if I if I land on him, which I will land, you know, we got 12 rounds. I'm going to hit him, you know, and if I hit him flush with a flush shot, then I think it, I think it might be over. And Regis, obviously the maximum amount of rounds that you've been thus far as a pro is eight rounds. Um, in mm-hmm. Victor Postel's last nine fights, his last nine fights have all, they've all gone either eight rounds or more. I think he's had a couple of eight rounders that have gone the distance. But aside from that, he's done a lot of 10 and 12 rounds. Do you believe if this fight goes long, um, you know, that you'll be able to stay with that pace? Definitely so. Yeah, I train for that, you know. Um me and my trainers actually just talked about that earlier. You know, a lot of people that you know, just because somebody has a, a a big knockout punch and they knocking people out, then of course, you know, fans start to say, Oh, he can't go the distance but that's not true, you know, it because in a gym sometimes I do fifteen rounds in the gym with like five or six different dudes, you know. So my my style is I get stronger after every fight. I not after every fight. After every round I get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's how I train to get stronger and stronger, you know. So, and I do it with, you know, different spawn partners. You know, we will switch them out after every three rounds or something like that. We'll switch our spawn partners. So, I, I definitely don't think 12 rounds will be nothing for me. Um, I, I, I won't get tired. And I, I definitely hope that, you know, the fight goes long. You know, I hope it, I hope it goes, you know, uh maybe 10 rounds or something like that so I can show people that I do get stronger after every round you know how I recover and you know how my body is because that's how I train I train to get stronger after every round and you know um even like I said in, today in sparring you know I just I, I kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger and I break my opponents down you know so I, I hope it does you know but it, like I said if I hit them it, it might be lights out 
I want to talk about your punching power. Obviously, Victor Postel went 12 rounds with Crawford. He lost the decision. He went 10 rounds with one of the hardest punchers, pound for pound, in my opinion, in Lucas Matisse. He ended up stopping him. You have actually got a higher knockout ratio than both Matisse and Crawford, but obviously you haven't fought at the same kind of level at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there an incentive to try and make a statement here against Postel? If you were to become the first man to stop him, would that be the icing on the cake? Yes, definitely would. Yeah, definitely would. I I definitely want to make a statement. All my fights, I want to make a statement. My last fight, you know, um, I want to make a statement against Joel Diaz Jr. And this fight, I definitely do want to make a statement, you know, because I feel like I'm one of the best, you know, fighters in the world at my weight division right now. And, you know, everybody talk about Crawford, 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 you know, so this will be a common opponent. Well, me and him have a common opponent, but this will be a high class common opponent, you know. So I think I think it'll definitely be um, if I can if I can stop Victor Post, I, I definitely think it'll be a big time statement, you know, um, in, in shorter boxing world. Like, really, he he's serious. You know, he's legit. He really is serious. You know, so, yeah, that's. I won't say that's the goal to knock him out, but you know my 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 thing is to make a statement. You know I, I won't say because I don't chase the knockout. You know, but it's just like I said, my style is just to punish my opponent. You know, so it, it kind of goes hand in hand. If you punish somebody for so long, they're gonna you, you know you're gonna stop them eventually. And as I mentioned just earlier, the WBC, uh, the full world title, it's being, it's being contested for just eight days after your fight. Obviously, you mentioned Jose Ramirez, who's ranked number three, Amir Imam ranked number one. Who do you see winning that fight? And should you win this postal fight? Are your eyes firmly set on the winner of that fight and nowhere else? Um, I won't say it's firmly set because, you know, if... if... You know, boxing is definitely, you know, it's a, it's about the belts and about the titles and stuff like that, Um, you know. But they might offer me something bigger, you know. They might, after, especially if I if I knock Post all out, they might offer me Adrian Brona or Mikey Garcia or somebody, you know, somebody with a bigger name, you know, for a different type of belt. But, so I, I wouldn't say I'm eyeing those two, but I definitely would go to that fight. I definitely would be at the fight. I definitely would go, and, and you know, to answer your question about, um, who will win? I I don't know. I think it's a fifty fifty fight. You know, um, Jose Ramirez he has a come forward Mexican style, um, and you know Amir Mann, You know he's he's slick. You know he's a he's a slick American fighter, American um, style fighter. You know, and he has big knockout power in his right hand. Um, but if I had to if I had to bet on it, I'll bet Jose Ramirez because you know, like I said, um, Granados knocked him out. You know, and Granados has almost the same type of style, just a come forward style. Now it's just all about if Jose Ramirez can take that, you know, he can take that right hand early. And if he can, I feel like he probably will break, he'll probably break him down later in the fight, you know. So I, I go with, I, I, I think I'm rolling with Jose Ramirez on this fight. And I just want to quickly get your take on a couple of other fights that are happening um, at 140 or nearabouts. Um, you don't have to really go into great detail. You can just give me a name. Who do you reckon, because uh, it's a great time to be at 140, of course, but who do you reckon wins the fight between Sergei Lipanets and Mikey Garcia? Do you think Mikey Garcia will have too much for Lipanets? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think Mikey Garcia. Uh, Lipanets is a, he's a strong, and he's a strong fighter, and, um, He's he's awkward. He has a different type of awkward style, but you know, I think I think Michael Garcia might be a little too much for him. I definitely I I think so. Um, he just he's fundamentally, you know, and um, I was talking about earlier, you know, Michael Garcia. He just he's very he has very very good fundamentals. He's nothing to me. He's nothing special, you know, but his fundamentals is just you know spectacular. So maybe that's that's the special thing about him is that he has very very good fundamentals. So you know, um, I go with yeah, Michael Garcia. And as you mentioned a few times in this interview already, Adrian Broner taking on Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa is a man that I don't think we can overlook too much. I think he's he's a, he's a very good fighter. I know that he's wanted this fight for a very long time, and obviously he's got it now. Um, but yes, yeah, a hard one to choose. It, I think for me, it kind of depends which Broner turns up on the night. Yeah, you it, uh, know, it, it like it it definitely all depends on which Broner turns up. You know, I you know I go with Omar Figueroa because. Like you say, you never know what Broner's gonna turn up. You know, he always says, "Oh, I'm gonna be serious. I'm gonna be serious." And I just don't, I don't think he can be serious. You know, I think he's gonna, you know, bullshit and and camp some type of way. He's gonna do something some type of way. You know, but if he's on point, I think he'll definitely beat Omar Figueroa. But I, I just go Omar Figueroa because 
the style matchup, you know. Um, everybody that beat Broner, you know, the, the people that beat Broner had the rough Mexican style that just came in and, and fought him. And that's the same thing Figueroa does. He's, he's not going to stop. He's going to fight three minutes of every round. And, you know, he's just going to keep pounding and pounding and pounding. He's going to get hit, but he's going to keep coming. And I don't think Brona can handle that type of pressure, especially for 12 rounds, you know, because, you know, against Marcus Medina, you know, he, that's who beat him. And he had the same type of style. And um, Sean Porter, you know, he had the same type of style. You know, Mike Garcia beat him, but it was it was a little different, you know. But, yeah, I go with um, Omar Figueroa. I'm coming down to the last few questions now, Regis. I just want to ask you this. I like to ask all the, uh, you know, all the young pros that are coming up in the United States. Who are some of the big names that you've sparred with? Um, well, I sparred with a couple of people. Well, the Charlo twins. You know, we all we actually are close friends. You know, so we all came up together um, as amateurs. Um, the Charlo twins, Austin Trout, um, Omar Henry. I don't know if you remember Omar Henry. He was a fighter. He died of um, cancer. Like. Uh, probably five, six years ago, or something like that. He was, and he was like prospect of the year at the time. Um, yeah, that's that's the big as far as big names go. Yeah, that's all the yeah Omar, the Charlo twins, and um, it, of course Errol Spence. No, I fought Errol Spence. I didn't. I didn't spar. We, me and him, fought in the amateurs. And yeah, Austin Trout. That's that's the big names I spar with. Okay, it's an it's an impressive list there, and I like to ask this question to all of the the people that we speak to from overseas. Also, I want to ask you. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Regis. Um, mm-hmm. Who would you say is your favorite UK fighter? It can be a guy that's retired years and years ago. It can be a guy who's still fighting today. Any era. Any era. Oh man, that's hard. It's between. It's definitely between um, Ricky Hatton, um, Prince Nassim. Uh, Lennox, Lennox Lewis. Um, I, I would say Prince Nassim because he's a southpaw. I definitely would say <laughs> Prince, probably Prince Nassim Hamid because he's a southpaw. And he was just so explosive. He had so much power. He was a little man with so much power. He was just very, very entertaining, you know. Um, and you know, Ricky Hatton was just very entertaining. Also, he had that just bully style, and you know, definitely um, Lennox because Lennox was just, you know, he was shit. He was just a man. He beat everybody that they almost beat everybody they put in front of him. He was just he was that good but you know if i had to say number one it'll, it'll definitely be prince nassim yeah yeah that's the most popular answer prince nassim everybody loved the prince and the last two questions now for you um i know that you've mentioned a few names since we've been on obviously um you know first and foremost you've got to get through this fight come march the 9th after that you know there's there's going to be lots of windows and doors if you like that will open for you but who is the primary name Regis it doesn't just have to be at 140 it can be wherever you like but who would you most want to fight the one name that stands out you want that guy more than anybody else Oh man that's a hard question man um you know because you're going to say started... Brona straight away I thought yeah, you were well, going to say Brona Yeah I was I was going to say Brona I am going to say Brona that's why <laughs> I want him it's either between Brona or Crawford you know but I, I would say Crawford because of but he's going up to forty seven now. You know, I'm I'm a competitor. I do this because I love to compete. I, I love the pressure and I love to compete and I wanna be in there with somebody good. So I would say Crawford because of that, because he's so good and he's so talented, he's so special that I would wanna fight against him to prove people that I can beat him. But Broner, I would say Broner because of his name. His name is so big, um, you know, but his skills are not as big as his name is no more you know um i really do hope i hope he wins this fight if he can win this fight against omar figueroa then me and him can fight you know then most likely me and him can fight down the line you know i wouldn't even have to fight um the winner of ramirez in the mind you know they can keep that belt you know i wouldn't even i don't think i would worry about it you know because i can fight broner for you know maybe another belt or something like that i definitely want the belts of course i definitely want to be a champion um you know, but yeah, if if I had to throw out two names, it'll definitely be um, Crawford, and you know, as far as the name wise, it'll definitely be Crawford and Broner. The two the two names, Crawford or Broner. Yeah, I have a fighter against you would certainly be something I'd like to see. And final question for you now, at Regis, I just want to ask you this: you don't have to give it to us if you don't want to, but we like to ask here and there. Mm-hmm. What is your prediction for your fight? How do you how do you have your arm raised come March ninth? 
Um, I definitely think I'm going to win. I'm very confident. Um, I really don't see how Post is going to beat me. I just can't see it. I, I really just can't, you know. Um, I don't know why. Usually you, usually before a fight, I want to feel um, – I want people to tell me – I want to read that I'm going to lose, some type of way I'm going to lose. You know, against George Diaz, you know, people were saying it was a 50-50 fight, and, you know, I just ran through him. But against, against um, you know, Post all it's everybody think I'm gonna knock him out. Everybody thinks that you know everybody I, I everybody I talk to and not just the people I talk to. I read about it and I see things posted and everybody thinks I'm gonna knock post all out. Um and and that's that's actually how I see it too. I just I can't see him making the distance. You know I can't see him going twelve rounds. I just I can't see it. I just I really can't. I can't see him because I know you know I know he got hit by Lucas Matisse, but I feel like I'm more more of a an explosive puncher. Matisse has big, he has heavy hands, but I have heavy hands and I'm accurate and I'm explosive at the same time and I'm fast and athletic. You know, I think that'll be the difference. I don't think Lucas Matisse is is athletic and fast as I am. You know, he has he definitely hits hard, but I have different things. You know, in, in in my power, you know, my speed and my accuracy. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I can't see it. I really just can't see how he's going to go the distance with me. I just can't see the fight going 12 rounds. I just, of course I can definitely be wrong, but I just can't see the fight going, going 12 rounds. So I feel like I will win by knockout. But um, I definitely can't. I'm not Ali. Not that great. I can't predict the round. <laughs> no, that that will do. That will do. Like I say, if you do, if you do stop him and do something that uh, Matisse and Crawford couldn't do, then that will certainly uh, be be a huge, huge thing. I'm sure that your name and your stock will absolutely shoot upwards. But yeah, listen, mm-hmm. it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Regis. Thank you for your time. Best of luck for March the ninth, and we'll catch up sometime after. I'm sure. Cool, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Okay, and this wraps up episode 121 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I, as Sumra, has been I, as Sumra. A big thank you to our two guests on this week's show, both of them undefeated, both of them knockout artists. One's a current WBC world champion. The other one is a future WBC world champion also. You can follow David Benavidez on Twitter at Benavidez300, and you can follow Regis Progre at R. Progray. That's R P R O G R A I S. The prediction league currently stands at 17 points for me, 21 points for Ayers, and you, the listeners, in the lead, running away with it with 23 points. Look out for our poll on Twitter coming in the next few days for the predictions for next week's boxing, including uh, Chris Eubank Jr. and George Groves and the rest of it. Thank you all for listening once again. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you next week. <laughs>